I think I figured out exactly what's going on, and I think I know what that means for what our stocks are going to do, which stocks are going to perform well, which stocks might underperform, which countries might over or underperform, what's going on with inflation, the wage price spiral, the labor recession, CapEx spending in S&P 500 companies, what happened with earnings season, what Jerome Powell has told us, literally everything together in one video. Now that's a lot of information. So I absolutely encourage you take a deep breath, press the subscribe button, get a drink like me of Kahlua coffee and take a sip and just relax because we've got a lot to cover. Because you might remember after all that I went bearish in March of 2024. I made a video saying I'm going to cash. Why would I do that? After all, Everything's fine now. That's true. But why did we go bearish? And have things actually changed? Has the data, the underlying fact set changed? Well, to understand what's changed, we have to first understand what we thought in March. So let's think about zooming back to March. First quarter so far, hot inflation data offsetting the disinflationary progress we had noted in goods and some non-housing services. In other words, inflation coming back for a second wave. Wages were growing faster than expected, leading some to fear there might be a wage price spiral. In other words, second wave of inflation. GDP weakened for Q1 despite hot estimates. In other words, stagflation. It's not good, right? Manufacturing was booming out of a recession, but credit card and auto loan delinquencies were rising. So we were of this impression that, okay, so are we going into stagflation at the same time as people are going bankrupt? And then Jerome Powell's being blind to the pain people are feeling by killing flexible average inflation targeting? That was supposed to be our bunny coming out of the hat. That was supposed to be good freaking news that he was gonna one day just go, ah. It all averages 2%. And we were all going to go, okay, whatever, bro. But whatever, you know, stonks would go up, so it'd be okay. Well, then he killed flexible average inflation targeting. This was a terrible setup. March was a horrible setup. Everything was positioned for a sell-off after March. I mean, consider for a moment. Not only were we screaming second wave of inflation... We needed higher rates was another thing we were screaming. The wage price spiral, poor folks are defaulting, no fate. Earnings season is coming up. Iran is literally attacking Israel and relying on the United Kingdom and the United States to defend them. Holy smokes. This is bad. Like all of that was really, really bad. So I went to cash and I decided to start trading. In fact, I'll show you the account really quickly. I decided, hey, while I'm sitting in cash, I may as well start trading. And I'm gonna keep this trading account even when I go back to sort of all in, if you will. But this is my trading account. It started at about 900K a couple months ago. And you'll see that here, I just put some screenshots up. This is my actual account. This is the only account that I really trade in. Uh, otherwise, it'd be long form, uh, long term portfolio adjustments. Here you could see this is my PL uh, of just the last three trading days. So Friday, Monday, Tuesday. So you can see my losses and my winners over the last three trading days here. And uh, you could see I'm up 209K. Over the last two days, I'm up 133K. And my realized PL today was $43,000. Over the last one month, we're up eight. Hundred and seventy thousand dollars. It's pretty awesome. Now it's not always up, but if you do want all of these buy sell alerts that I send when I see a trend or when I make a move, check out the Stocks and Psychology and Money Group. We've got another coupon expiring at the end of this month. That's May thirty first, but it's going to sneak up on you sooner than you expect. And my goal is to continue to send alerts between now and the end of the month, and hopefully. Hopefully, the trading account grows. Now again, my goal is to teach you how to fish, not to guarantee that you can fish and catch fish. It's to help you learn, hey, maybe throw the rod or hold the rod and throw the line this way, cast the line, so to speak, in this manner and reel it in with this strategy. And a lot of it is about helping you learn how to trade. 
and the trade alerts are sort of the vehicle for that education. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Stocks and Site Group comes with a lifetime access. You pay once, no monthly fee, and uh, look forward to seeing you there. The goal now is how much can we grow that portfolio? Now, really, with that said, what ended up playing out? So we just had a lot of fear. Remember, second wave of inflation, wage price spiral, uh, Iran, Israel, uh, people defaulting. This was a really, really bad setup. So how did it unfold? Well, Jerome Powell killed the idea of higher interest rates. Instead, he settled for longer rates basically being uh, at this level, but very, very unlikely higher. He also somewhat brought back flexible average inflation targeting. Like, I think people think I'm a flip-flopper because I cover the Fed so much. I, I do also change my mind too when the data changes, but quite frankly, how many freaking times is J-Pow gonna flip? It takes a flip-flopper to know a flip-flopper. The bro literally killed fate and then brought it back in a new life. It's like, no, 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 we don't need flexible average inflation targeting anymore because we only used that when inflation was averaging too low. We were at 1.75, so we're like, no, 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 it's okay. We're still at 2%. Now that we're above it, we don't need it anymore. So he kills fate. How does he bring it back? Literally with, well, if inflation between the three buckets, goods, housing services, and non-housing services average 2%, we're good with that. This guy cannot make up his mind. Come on. Then we're like, okay, but, but what about the stagflationary GDP report? Well, if you adjust out exports and inventory buildup, GDP is growing at over 3.1%. So we are doing really well, actually. Like, oh. Okay, what about the wage price spiral, Jerome Powell? Yeah. We're not worried about that one either, Mr. Meat Kevin. Because see, wages grew rapidly in 2023, yet we had rapid disinflation. What? Disinflation? Prices are still high. Yeah, prices are still high. And you know what Jay Powell says to that? Hopefully you can make more money because prices might not be coming down anytime soon. You're just gonna have to suffer with those higher prices, but at least the rate of growth is coming down. Bro, Jay is gonna piss a lot of freaking people off. Let's just put it that way. But these are the unwindings that he's giving us of concerns. He's literally, I feel like going through the list of why Kevin sold and one by one going, you're wrong, 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 still wrong, also wrong, wrong. <laughs> bro! <laughs> so, so then, it's like, okay, okay, but, but, but bro, we now have three months of higher inflation data. Remember how he was like in January? Ah, eh, one report doesn't make a trend. Eh, two reports doesn't make a trend. Then we get three reports in a row of inflation data. And what is it? We expected the first quarter to be lumpy. All along expectations. <sighs> okay, but what about the delinquencies, j Bell? Eh, those are only slightly above 2019 levels. What about interest rate cuts, j Bell? Eh, we'll see what the market thinks. Market's pricing at 1.7 cuts for this year, likely in the fourth quarter, and that's incorporating some of the Fed speak that we had this morning that we're likely going to get it somewhere between September and December. Okay, but, but what about Iran? I mean, Iran and geopolitics are going down nuts. Oh, President Rice dies. Of course, it was an accidental death. Sure, a presidential helicopter happens to fly in really bad weather and I guess doesn't have an instrument flight rating or functioning tools for IFR and instead is using an older helicopter that clearly can't fly in the weather, but then flies in the weather anyway. Yeah, makes sense to me. No CIA involvement here at all, because that's just purely a speculation. It's not like the CIA was known for literally having a, uh, what was it, a venom gun, that they could shoot people with a venom gun and make it look like they went into cardiac arrest from natural causes. The CIA is famous for making people disappear accidentally. It was an accident. <laughs> Okay, but what about Israel crossing Biden's red line? Come on, man, you can't undo any uh, all of this. Oh wait, 
Biden then redefined his red line as, well, Israel didn't technically, you know, go into Rafa. They went into Rafa, but, but they didn't go into the population center. So it's, it's different, you see? <laughs> like, what the? F I just want to scream and go, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, what? Okay, okay. What about earnings? Earnings. I saw, I saw, I seen some stocks go down after them earnings came out. Yeah. <laughs> well, we still beat with an average of 8.5% and headline growth was up 11.6% across S&P 500 companies, the highest level in two years per Deutsche Bank. And no, Deutsche Bank doesn't say that Stonks usually go down after that. Instead, Deutsche Bank says growth typically goes higher in a cyclical recovery because frankly, they see the rolling recession of 2022 as having been just that, a rolling recession. And now we are cyclically recovering from it. And then who would have guessed, but Mike Wilson capitulated again. And then almost out of nowhere, Roaring Kitty gets resurrected. And we get a 2021 style momentum rally in GME and AMC and then some penny stocks who then promptly raise money, which is what you're supposed to do. <laughs> what the hell? This is so crazy. This is like, what? Okay. Anyway. So on May 15th, uh, about uh, six days ago, I suggested that indices and mega caps could like higher. Since then, Microsoft is up 2.6, Apple up 2.3, Google up 4.2, NVIDIA up 3.1, Tesla up 3.6. Tesla's actually up quite a bit today in what I believe is a short squeeze. Remember, you got like 19 billion in notational short out there. Uh, the percent of float is really only like 3.95% short or whatever. It's on the smaller side. Uh, and Tesla's really a whole other story, a whole separate video. Uh, it's possible a lot of the negative of Tesla is already priced in, though there's a lot of fear around the stock, uh, uh, you know, vote that comes out within really the next three weeks. So you'll have some volatility between now and then. But what's next outside of Tesla broadly for inflation and the second wave and, and stocks and, and which stocks and... Kevin, what is going on? Well, just don't look at Bitcoin. Oh wait, actually maybe do look at Bitcoin because as usual, it's bouncing between my lines, the 71.1 line, that line's been here forever, the 61,000 or 69,000 line, that line's been there forever. You know these because you've watched my videos and you could see, oh wow, we had a breakout of the downtrend. What is that breakout of the downtrend signal? It actually signals that Bitcoin and Ethereum are a, either really excited about maybe the SEC, given that now JPM is rolling over on this and suggesting that you know Ethereum ETF is going to get approved, suggesting maybe the SEC will roll over and approve the Ethereum ETF, and or it's pricing in a continuation of the Nike swoosh parte. Now, a lot of people get upset when I say the Nike swoosh, but remember I've always said a volatile Nike swoosh. So just because I went a little bearish in March doesn't mean I haven't been a believer of the Nike swoosh. Now, before we keep going on inflation and some of the other really important things about election and which sectors to pay attention to, it's just really worth clearing up the record of my mistakes and uh, what, what has happened so people can kind of see the trajectory. Quickly, let's see how fast I can do it. Jan 22, I go cash, I make Titanic videos, I'm like, get the hell out. Now I went bullish Tesla, earlier, like Q2 uh, in the summerish, Q2 in the summerish of 2022, that was a mistake. In November of 2022, I launched a fund. This is not an advertisement for that fund. And I reiterated that I was bullish the interest rate sensitive stocks like Tesla and face. Oops, that was a mistake. And chips along with the Nike swoosh recovery. Well, interest rates were the wrong choice. Interest rate sensitive stocks, they were the wrong choice. Way too early on those. But the Nike swoosh was based on the idea that it would take time for people to realize that inflation is gone and deflation is next. Don't mind the fact that Costco, Target, and Walmart are now having price wars over goods to get people to come back to their stores. And basically any single goods company you read an earnings call on, when's the last time you read an earnings call? Well, if you're part of our course member live streams, probably like yesterday, because we read them almost every single day. So I hope you're a part of them. You get lifetime access to those course member live streams as well. And you can go through the archive and see our analysis on individual different tickers too. People really like that. 
good added value that sort of keeps growing every day. But anyway, chips obviously were the right choice, some luck there, and the Nike, Nike swoosh played out through 23 and early 2024. The downside is Tesla didn't, and Tesla had its own problems. That was a bit of an anchor, but again, that's really a topic for a different video. Now, yes, I went bearish in March, but I think it's really important to remember that was based on all of the insanity that, quite frankly, was kind of scary in March. It's like, whoa, we're due for a pullback. And we did have a pullback, 6.9 in the NAS and 5% on the S&P 500. It just didn't last long. So even though at one point I was like 40% cash, uh, or more, and I was rotating into stocks slowly, I didn't get fully into stocks. So where do we sit now? Is it time to go all in on stocks? Well, first, I want to reiterate, I believe the Nike swoosh will continue. And I believe it is time to start deploying the rest of the cash into a diversified portfolio of stocks. And I'm going to explain why first and then look at potentially which stocks and sectors. Okay, let's start with the second wave. Deutsche Bank has convinced me, and this just reiterates all of the reading that I've been doing through 2022 and 2023. This is the mindset that I've had for basically two years. This is just a reiteration. It's putting me back on the path. Deutsche Bank has convinced me that the second wave of inflation is dead. Yes, it is true that commodities are rising and becoming slightly more expensive. You'll notice that commodities, I'll show you on screen here, commodities have been rising since about February 23. And we have seen certain sectors lag in inflation. Specifically, we've seen car insurance lag, the healthcare sector lag, especially health insurance. Very normal, by the way it takes a while for those costs to show up in insurance companies. And then it takes even longer for insurance companies to actually raise your premiums without losing all their customers. So that can take sometimes two years, hence the lagging effect of insurance, car insurance, healthcare, healthcare affecting car insurance. Uh, and then obviously the scam of owner's equivalent rents. Look, I, I don't have this plane to stare at I have this plane to fly around the country and understand what's going on on the ground. I understand that rents are either collapsing in certain overbuilt markets or are flat to slightly declining in some of the underbuilt markets. Underbuilt markets are seeing home prices rise. Overbuilt markets are seeing home prices fall. All markets are likely to see inventory rise, meaning the third and fourth quarter of this year should be pretty dang juicy for buying real estate. Multifamily is already pretty juicy. Quick real estate segment. Point of that is market rents are down, baby. But owner's equivalent rents are a weird measure we use in America to define what's going on with rents in America. And it's basically a way of saying, hey, what's everybody paying in rent right now? And so it looks at, let's say, 100 people and says, oh, y'all paying $3,000? Oh, okay. Well, one person leaves, rents a new place. Rents the new place for 20% less. That'd be $2,400 a month. What's the average rent now? I don't know, probably like $29.95. But is that what the market rent is? No. The market rent is the last rent the market traded at, which would be $2,400. So basically, rent has fallen a lot, but most people aren't realizing that because they haven't moved. And that moving is a pain in the butt. So the fact that moving is a pain in the butt is actually keeping rents artificial, or, um, inflation artificially high should be a lot lower based on market rents. But that's not how we calculate our inflation data. We calculate it in a weird way to reflect what people are currently paying versus what the market is offering you. Okay, and there's a reason for that. It's not that easy to get a rent reduction. Good luck getting a rent reduction from your landlord. It's hard. So is there a way we can isolate this problem? Well, the answer is yes. We can isolate the problem by using something known as the Harmonized Index of Consumer Prices. This is the HICP. It is the European version of measuring inflation. And what does good old Deutsche Bank, get it, Deutsche, European, bank, say about US inflation if you apply harmonized inflation? Here you go. Take a look at this. 
A comparison with Europe indicates the stickiness of U.S. inflation measures reflect reflects that in owner's equivalent rent with comparable core U.S. HICP inflation running at 2% for the last nine months. In English, inflation already dead. Instead, U.S. inflation reflects second round effects, basically the insurance problem. So in other words, Deutsche Bank is like, yo, it's already dead, bro. It's done, man. Inflation gone. Now, I, I understand a lot of people are like, bro, man, I don't know, man. Food's still really expensive. Grocery stores, for again, and it, the idea is that it's not getting more expensive and not that it's getting less expensive. If it's less expensive. You better hope you got a really good job because you might lose your job because if you got deflation, you might be going into a recession. Now, you're starting to get goods deflation. Look at the price wars, but you haven't broadly seen deflation yet. Okay, so, huh, inflation is dead. Okay, so, well, what's next then? I mean, like, consumers don't have a lot of money anymore to keep spending to prop this economy up, right? Well, consumers are driven by jobs. And the labor market is still tight. Part of that due to legal and illegal immigration. But part may also be sustained by, guess what? An increase in capital expenditures by companies. Yes. Per Deutsche Bank, we have an upside risk from CapEx and inventory restocking. The S&P CapEx growth has slowed sharply from its late 2022 peak. However, CapEx typically lags earnings by about three quarters. In other words, as earnings are coming in really well right now in Q1, we might actually in the third and fourth quarter when people are worried about us going into a recession, see a resurgence of CapEx. That means growth might actually accelerate rather than fall. Huh. And Deutsche Bank believes that residual inflation will be gone by roughly January of 2025, quote, without requiring a slowdown in growth or higher unemployment. Obviously, this is ideal for the larger companies, not so great for the interest rate ones, interest rate sensitive ones, though they might do something known as rubber banding. What is rubber banding? Rubber banding is, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to pull that up. Those were, let me put that away. Those were the realized P&Ls of the last few days in my trading account again. Sorry, it's just, it's just so delicious. Have you joined the Stocks and Psychology of Money group yet? If you haven't yet, coupon expires soon. Email us if you need a bundle code at staff at meetkevin.com or if you got any questions. We'll take care of you. Somebody reached out to me personally today. I made sure they were taken care of. My goal is to make sure you are taken care of. I live to please and to teach. I actually kind of, like I could spend all day making a video like this and then I get really excited about it and then I'll take a day off and then I'll go focus on real estate. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's all in balance. But there's something known as the rubber band up and inflation or interest rate sensitive stocks may rubber band. See, the rubber band would be Microsoft and Apple keep getting more and more expensive, more and more expensive, more and more expensive. The more expensive they get, and the more Tesla trades sideways, the more it actually looks cheaper. The higher that goes, the cheaper this little baby looks. Oh, And it could actually kind of rubber band up with them. Eh? Something to keep in mind. I think that's one of the reasons we had like a 6% rally on Tesla today. It's definitely trading calls on that. I'm like, oh, breakout, here we go. Trust the lines. Anyway, what about earnings growth? Well, multiples have expanded, but Deutsche Bank says this is normal. In fact, they go as far as saying the last time we came out of a recession, we had multiples exceed 20. We're now at 22. And this is really normal because you're coming out of very, very low growth. And we basically had a mini recession, even though it's technically not defined as a recession yet. Okay, so what are you saying, Deutsche Bank? Well, Deutsche Bank is basically saying the Nike swoosh is here. Here's a logarithmic scale showing you that a $5,500 price target for the S&P 500 is actually, in their mind, conservative for the year end. In fact, they say equities have rallied every time rates went into a range and volatility fell. What does that mean? Well, uh, first of all, 
rates going into a range means trading range. And if you look at the 10 year treasury, you could see it's basically been dropped off of 4.7. It's been sitting around 4.35. And at the same time, what's happened with the volatility index? Uh, uh, oh, volatility's fallen. So a consolidating 10 year yield and low volatility has equaled higher stocks. And they expect that to continue. I see. Well, what about geopolitics? Oh, Deutsche Bank says geopolitics will create sharp but short-lived sell-offs like what we saw in April. Okay, well, what about elections? Ah, yes. Well, usually in a close election, stocks fall in October leading into the election. But in both close and predictable elections, stocks are higher afterwards. You remove the uncertainty, the the fear of what might happen after an election. <sighs> okay, fine then. But what about the fact that we have a tight labor market? That would be bad for the wage price spiral, even though Jerome Powell told us not to worry about the tight labor market, right? <sighs> Deutsche Bank has a response to that as well. Deutsche Bank says, oh yes. The tight labor market might actually create a boom in productivity and productivity booms actually allow the cycle to continue much like it did in the 90s. In fact, productivity booms are just a response to tight labor supported today by artificial intelligence. But you won't be able to identify that until it's too late. You notice that in the rear view mirror. So just assume the productivity boom is already happening. They's either perma bulls or they're onto something. And when you tie together what they're saying with what j told us, what earnings told us, and what the data says, yes, we could still fall into a recession if unemployment claims skyrocket and then it's too late. But are the signs that that's around the corner right now? Not really. I mean, after all, what are companies doing? Oh, that's right. Companies are issuing record stock buybacks. <sighs> okay, so what sectors do they recommend? Well, they suggest you should get in, well, they're neutral on tech, neutral on industrials, energy, and real estate, and they're bullish on financials. Those are like banks. SoFi, I don't know. Consumer cyclicals, those are going to be your Teslas. Materials and utilities and Europe. Okay. I have home bias. I prefer the Europe, uh, US over Europe. And net interest uh, income uh, at financials uh, may still be in decline for the next two quarters, at least, from what we're hearing from banks. Uh, and cyclicals are kind of like cars. But DB responded to both of those and says, yeah, both of those negatives are already priced in. In fact, just this is my opinion. You could look at Rocket Mortgage and you could already see them starting to perform pretty well and, and price in that boom, so to speak. Well, hot damn. So what am I going to do? Well, rain or shine, maybe a little bit before. Probably some more after. I'm going to take that extra bit of cash we got. I'm going to start going shopping again. But I'm going to do so in a diversified ETF. In fact, something that I thought was really interesting uh, was you had a B of A piece on flows. In recent weeks, ETF outflows, uh, inflows rather, have outpaced single stock flows. And year-to-date cumulative inflows to ETFs are larger compared to that of single stocks. Okay, English, please. People buying ETFs they like instead of single stocks. People burned by the Tesla. People burned by the sofa. The all in on the palin of the tear. These are all great companies. But having some diversification is a really good thing. So personally, I'm probably going to increase my exposure to a diversified ETF that has uh, exposure to Apple, Tesla, NVIDIA, 
Uh, probably Trade Desk is a juicy one to be in there. Amazon's a juicy one. Th these are some of the things I like. I might even be open to some of the other SaaS businesses. I've really been eyeballing and wanting. <sighs> as well as some other pricing power-based stocks. In other words, companies that I think in a deflationary time will have the best ability to compete, not just you know on, on actually lower prices, but higher margins with those lower prices. That is a form of pricing power. If you can lower prices and have higher margins, that is a form of pricing power. It's a next level derivative almost. Uh, it's a little more complicated to think of it that way, but anyway. Uh, I did notice that um, industrials saw the largest outflows, which, you know, it, it, you, you also saw consumer discretionary materials uh, have the most inflows and energy and healthcare also have the most outflows. Basically, when people buy ETFs, they're just buying stuff that's going up and they're selling stuff that's going down. This is very, very normal. Personally, I'm just, put me in a delicious ETF that's not like too diversified, but has some diversification. That's just my POV. That's just my personal transparent POV. I'm not pitching any kind. Pick whatever you want. This is not a sales pitch. The only thing I am selling is a beautiful educational group that you could join. The Stocks and Psychology of Money group at meetkevin.com and a beautiful event that we are holding June 21st to June 23rd, also available at meetkevin.com. You can actually bundle the course and the event. It's going to be incredible. In Vegas, you're gonna learn the most you've ever learned about finance, real estate, lots of real estate. We're gonna have Ben Mala there. So be there or be square. <laughs> anyway. If you have questions, email us at staff at me, and we'll see you next one. Thanks so much. Goodbye. I do not advertise these things that you told us here. I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, licensed real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is not personalized advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show shall not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purposes of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services we may benefit from. I also personally operate an actively managed ETF. I may personally hold or otherwise hold long or short positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuer other than HouseHack, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Make sure if you're considering investing in HouseHack to always read the PPM at HouseHack.com.